Namaste friends, this is Aparna from Ship Connections, your friend and guide on the path of yoga and mindfulness. And as you know that my slogan is my mind, my friend, because you can use any tools of these to make your mind your best friend. And on 21st June, there is an upcoming International Yoga Day. United Nations recognized yoga's universal appeal on 11th December 2014 and United Nations proclaimed 21st June as the International Day of Yoga by Resolution 69 by 131 and this day is celebrated all across the globe to raise awareness about yoga and its holistic approach to health. The theme for this year's Yoga Day 2021 is Yoga at Home and Yoga with Family. By practicing yoga regularly, anyone can achieve harmony between mind and body, which brings immense peace and a sense of well-being that we all are longing for, and especially so during the pandemic. We have an online Meet International Yoga Day for 20th of June. The link is in the description box below, so you can sign up for this. But Today, I have a very special guest in our virtual studio, Shub Connections. So our guest is Christine Dunworth. Christine, namaste, you're very welcome. Namaste, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So a little bit of introduction about someone who like me believes that yoga is for everyone. So if you go on Christine's website, Yogra Yoga, you will see that she says, I welcome all people to my class, all genders, all colors, all creeds, all beliefs, all disabilities and all abilities. And when she teaches online, she says that she also welcomes cats and dogs. So you have no excuse not to be joining Christine's class. And um, she and I strongly believe that yoga is for everyone. So Christine is a mom of three kids and to a very patient man, Al. Uh, she's married to him for a long time. And she lives in a small town of Kilcock in uh, Ireland, in County Kildare. And she fell in love with yoga over 13 years ago and she hasn't stopped practicing or studying yoga. She's always upskilling, updating herself with new knowledge and new skills of yoga. She has completed a 200 hour teacher training, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, teacher training in 2016 with Paula Mitten of Durga, Ireland. And subsequently she went on to work and teach on a teacher training course with Paula Mitten in Durga, Ireland. And since then, she has completed 600 hours of training and she still doesn't feel she has done enough. And she has plans to probably continue and do more training in yoga. So without me talking too much, I would like to hear from Christine that what is yoga for you? And I will be asking a few questions so that you can make a progress in your journey and be inspired from Christine that how to practice yoga and how not to stop on the path of yoga. But in the end, if you stay till the end, she's going to demonstrate some of her very favorite poses of yoga. So do stay till the end and do subscribe to this channel because I'm determined to keep you connected to you and to yoga and to mindfulness. So Christine, tell us a little bit about you. What got you started on the path of yoga and what is your definition of yoga? Well, when I was growing up, I never heard of yoga. So I grew up in Ireland and we never knew anything about it. And then when I got to be in my 20s, I had seen some celebrities were doing it. So Madonna was doing it and some others. And I was like, oh, what's that now? That looks really interesting, but I had no understanding of it. 
And then I decided to go to a yoga class. So I went along, I bought the mat and I went to the class and I was really taken aback by what it was because I thought it was going to be a fitness class. So I was like, hmm, this was a bit different. They were doing pranayama and I was a little bit frightened because I didn't know what it was. And um, they were doing a lion's breath, you know, like, and I was thinking, wow, that's really intense. I've never experienced anything like that. So then I just decided to practice myself at home a little bit and um, I got some DVDs and I was doing it at home. So I got a little bit more familiar and then I realized it wasn't a fitness class. (laughs) I realized there was so much more to it. And, um, you know, people are always talking about celebrities and, you know, how they're, um, you know, doing yoga just as a fitness thing. But actually, one of the DVDs I had was Shilpa Shetty. And I thought she was so lovely and I loved her explanation of yoga and she really made it seem like something that I could be studying and that I could be interested in. So then about 13 years ago, I was pregnant with my little boy who was 12 yesterday. So I decided to go to a pregnancy yoga class and it was with our teacher, Paula Mitten, who's an amazing um, Irish teacher. And she introduced me even more to the different layers that were the yoga practice and to the eight limbed path and really to the mindful aspect of it as well, especially with the pregnancy yoga. We weren't doing a lot of physical asana. It was very mindful. Um, And then I just continued to keep practicing after that. But my practice took a turn. It was it did become very physical for a long time. And I was practicing a lot of Ashtanga, a lot of Vinyasa. Um, and I was striving for that physical aspect of it. Um, I'm a busy person, busy mind, busy body, always moving. And for me, the sitting and the meditation and the mindfulness and all of that seemed a little bit far away for me. And then I did a teacher training in 2016 with Paula, as you mentioned. And for our teacher training every morning, it was a three week intensive. So we had 21 days every morning for one hour sitting meditating. And I had never done it before. And I was moving and I was itching and scratching. And, you know, I got into it. I got into a routine of it. And then I started to feel the benefits and to start to connect with my mind. And that changed my yoga practice. Then when we started to study the eighth limbed path and how we could live a yogic life, that changed it as well. And then I went on to become a yoga teacher and to do more and more studies. And I think for me, yoga isn't this, it's not this blue mat. It's not these leggings. It's not what I'm moving about on the mat doing. It's when I come off the mat. And then when something happens in my life and I have to stop and go, how am I going to react to that? What can I do that's going to be the right thing to do, the the right path? Um, You know, how can I move through this world and this life without hurting anybody? And how can I bring joy and love to other people and to myself? So I think that's really what yoga has taught me is that, you know, it's, it's about all of us and it's about the whole earth and the world and we're all together. And this breath that we're doing, this breath that we're learning, we're all breathing together and we're all connected in one way or another. And um, yeah, I think that when I'm teaching yoga in the beginning, especially to people who've just started and they've never done it before, I'm not going to go right in there and be like, you know, this is what it's all about. I'm trying to introduce them really slowly. And then I'm giving them these layers of information and, uh, you know, trying to educate them in this way, whilst at the same time, trying to stay very honest and true to myself, but also respecting and being true to the traditional roots that is the yoga practice. So it's, it's, it's a big thing. It's all around in my life, I think. And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what it means to me. Thank you, Christine. So it's very much about the oneness that comes with yoga. And anybody who practices yoga for a long time and practices yoga regularly cannot remain untouched by this oneness that Christine was talking about. When we start to experience that we are all one and we are not separate. And um, that's yoga is all about. 
So, Christine, uh, you were very much mentioning, like me, I'm very active as well. My mind can also be very busy. And we are high energy people. We just love, you know, keep going. But yeah. probably that's why we benefit even more from doing these type of practices. Yes. And in Bhagavad Gita, which is uh, one of the ancient scripture and is considered very important to study when we are learning yoga practices and in, it's a very much integral part of our yoga teacher training. So in Bhagavad Gita chapter 6 in verse 34, it has been said that chanchala hi mana krishna pramathi bal vadadam tasyaham nigraham manne vayerivi sadushkaram the mind is very restless, turbulent, strong, and obstinate. Oh Krishna, it appears to me that it is more difficult to control than the wind. And that is the truth. That mind is even more difficult to control than the wind. It has a speed of the wind that it just flies off like that to the past or it flies off to the future. So Christine, from you, I want to know that how can we use yoga as an anchor for the mind to come to the body. So yoga can become an anchor to bring the mind home to the body and to find that lost connection or balance. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it happens quite subconsciously in the beginning. And for me, when I started to practice the physical asana, I didn't realize what was happening. So. I was becoming grounded and anchored through that physical practice, but I didn't realize it straight away. But then when I started to learn more about it, I was able to fine tune those techniques. And I'm now, I suppose, in what I teach to my students as well is, it's okay to have those fluctuations of the mind. You know, it's okay to have the thoughts coming and going. But when you even realize the thoughts are coming and going and you can take a hold and then be in that moment, even if it's for a split second, this is where the mindfulness begins, I think. And, you know, sometimes it's a stop start situation where you will come to a practice of perhaps meditation or even pranayam and the mind is going off, you're making the shopping list or you're thinking about that person that beeped at you at the traffic light earlier, or, you know, it's just, why is all this thoughts coming in? And then you go, oh, I'm overthinking, I'm thinking. Okay, I know I'm thinking, that's okay. Let's come back to the breath. Let's come back to these layers of my being. And that is when the mindfulness begins. That's the meditation. And even if it's a split second, then as time goes on, it's like you're gathering up those little pieces of clearness and you're putting them all together. And then it just gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And then hopefully someday it's not happened to me yet that I will be able to come to the mat <laughs> and find that clearness, that peace, that quiet in the mind. Um, but I think as human beings, you know, there's, there's just those fluctuations. They're like the waves. They're like the wind. You can't stop them completely. But once we start to notice and observe and acknowledge, then this is where it begins, I think. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I, I definitely think practice. Lots of, lots of coming to the mat, lots of practice with that, definitely. Absolutely. And um, like there is no other way around it. Practice, practice, practice. Practice yeah. makes possible. So yeah. it is possible to gain that um, steadiness of the mind and steadiness of the thoughts by more regular yoga practice. Yeah. So now coming to the pandemic, which mm -hmm. has affected everyone all around the world. And people in India at present are suffering more than anywhere else. But in our own ways, we are all suffering all the time, but more so during the pandemic. So Christine, has pandemic affected you personally in any way? Yes, it definitely has. And when I think back to that time, I remember the moment 
for me that the pandemic started. I was in Tesco's. I was doing the shopping. It was Thursday, the 12th of March, 2020. And I ha- was listening to the radio on my phone. And our Taoiseach came out and said the schools were closing and that we should close everything. And it was like everyone else was also listening on devices and everything stopped. And it was like, what? It was almost as if a rug had been pulled from underneath my feet. And the first thing I thought of was my students. It's Thursday evening. I'm teaching tonight. I've got a workshop at the weekend. What am I going to do? It was very personal, you know? I, I wasn't really thinking of this global effect. And then I went to the studio that evening. I taught my students. I remember hugging and kissing them as they were leaving. We had this immense fear. What, what's happening? What's going on? And no one had the answers to this question. We'd never experienced anything like that. And I definitely had never felt fear like that before in my life. Um, And I remember locking the door of the studio and walking out and coming home quite numb. And then as the days went by and things unfolded, you know, we thought we were going to be closed for two weeks. We were like, oh, it'll be fine. We'll be back open. And then this ripple effect started to happen. And it was a very emotional ripple effect because, first of all, I, I felt hurt. I was really internalizing this and going, oh, that's not fair. I can't open my studio. I can't have my students. I can't do my yoga practice. But then it was everybody else in the world was also being affected in much worse ways than I was. And I could almost feel that then happening. And it made my situation seem like, okay, that's manageable. It's not the end of the world that I've had to close the doors of the studio, that my children can't go to school. We were so lucky. None of us were um sick in our house like out of my family none of us got coronavirus but then I started to see neighbors got it and then a friend of ours died and that was really like that was really tragic and it really made me think a lot more about it um yeah the the whole thing was obviously as it was for everyone else as well turbulent life-changing But I still feel even to this day, I know we're over a year past that. And now it's like that ripple effect is going further and further. And like you said about India, I mean, I'm watching the news. I feel my heart is breaking for these people. And there's really like, I know there is things that we can do, but at the same time, we're feeling helpless that we can't help the rest of the world. We can only do what we can do in this moment and stay, I suppose, with our positive thoughts and sending out vibes of healing and love and compassion and understanding um, and doing the best that we can do with what we've got right now. But um, I think the pandemic, of course, it did change physically what was happening around me and the way I lived my life. But it made me realize a lot of things that I don't need a studio. I don't need to um, be teaching 20 classes per week. I don't need to go to the shopping center and buy new things you know, our family are the most important things, our community and people, you know, and going right back to that one breath to all of us breathing together, we're all connected. And I think that has really hit home with a lot of people who never thought about it before, me included. Um, You know, it's really made us sit up and realize we, we are really all in this together. You know, it's, and we have to change the way we do things globally. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's it's been enormous. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Christine, for sharing your personal story. And I'm sure a lot of people can uh, connect with this, what you have said, because a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people have lost their loved ones. A lot of people have lost their business. But there is another aspect of it. So it is very important that we keep the whole view and not focus only on the negative and the bad things that has happened. So um, I want to say about India when Christine found out about um, this um, situation that is going on in India, she contacted me and she asked me how can she help, how can she donate? And when I suggested one of the charities, she immediately made the donation. So she has a very kind heart and we really, really feel your kindness, Christine. You're so good. 
But can you tell me, Christine, that how and why it is so important, whether online or physical, that people should keep practicing yoga, especially now, so even if they haven't done before uh, pandemic? Yeah, um, it's funny, you know, I think in the beginning when we went online, the students, a lot of them were like, oh, yeah, I don't do online. I don't like the computer. I'm on it all day, you know. Um, I think that it's like you have to look at the computer as a door and it's going to bring you someplace else. And you can choose that door, which is, say, social media, which could be potentially toxic or maybe it's just fun and lighthearted and you're relaxing. Or maybe that door is into work and you have to go there on a daily basis. But then there's another door where you can access your yoga practice, you can access, um, you know, if you have a spiritual practice or if you have a religion, you can go there now through that door. Like it has so much potential. And in the beginning, I think people were looking at it in a one dimension that it was just for work because of course that's what this even zoom that's what it was designed for but then we found ways to use it for other things um like choir for instance my mom sings in a choir and um she's quite a social person and now her choir is on zoom and she's doing her choir she hasn't let that go and in the same way that she feels these really positive endorphins and positive feelings from her choir, you know, we're getting that from our yoga practice or anything else that you choose to do online as your thing, you know. And uh, I think after a few weeks, the students started to go, OK, we'll give it a go. We'll try Zoom. And then they realized it's it's the same but it's different. You're still having your practice. And even if you're not doing it on Zoom, if you're just rolling your mat out and you're just moving with your breath, or even if you're just lying there and being with yourself, it's important to keep that up, especially if it was your practice before. Um, I've noticed as well, I've got lots of new students since the pandemic started. So people who had never been able to come to class because perhaps they could not get a babysitter or I was too far away or they didn't have a yoga class in their town and now they're coming. And I just think that practice is so important. It feels to me like pressing a reset button. So a lot of the time in our lives, we can be coming overwhelmed or we're busy, you know, or maybe we're feeling depressed and down. And, um, you know, there can be that anxiety up here, but then there can be the depression down here and we can meet in the middle and press that reset button with our yoga practice. And I think that this pandemic has shown us as well. You don't need to be in a special place to do yoga. It doesn't have to be a studio. It can be your kitchen floor. It can be the end of your bed. It doesn't matter. It can be your garden. You don't even need a mat. You don't need these fancy yoga props. You can just do yoga anywhere. And I, I think that's shown us that, you know, um, and I, I, when the students used to come to the studios well I'd always lay the mat out I was really you know particular about this I'd have two blocks and a belt and a blanket and an eye pillow and now they're at home they don't have those things they don't even have a mat and they're still doing their practice and a lot of them have said from doing the online practice as well that they have started to just go oh you know I can just roll my mat out now and do this because I've got 10 minutes and like even 30 seconds is fine. 10 minutes is fine. If you've got an hour, that's amazing. You can do an hour. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think that has um, that has made people think more about doing yoga at home and getting the family involved. And you touched on that at the beginning there about, you know, having other family members come in and practice together or the cat or the dog. And like, it doesn't matter. Sometimes I'm practicing with my teacher and my children are walking in and out. It, it actually doesn't matter. They're not disturbing anyone. They're not disturbing me. I still do my practice. Sometimes my daughter will join in. She gets sick of it after a few minutes and then she leaves. But you know what? She's been on the mat. It's fine. So I think that, um, yeah, that's that's really made it more accessible to more people, you know? Yes. yes. And uh, when you are giving the example of... Uh, that you're practicing yoga and the cat or dog or the children are going around and actually they are seeing and they are probably they might get inspired someday and they might come to yes. Matt and say that mom I want to do yoga as well and that also reminds me 
Uh, I'm a midwife. So when we go for midwifery conference, like that's the only conference where at least one or two moms with their babies will come and they'll be sitting there and breastfeeding the baby and also attending the conference like everybody else. So yes. these are some steps that are so necessary now that the more inclusive we become for everybody else around us, the more we are likely to make a progress as a family or as professionals. Yeah. So now that time has come, if you have stayed till now for our interview and the session, now Christine is going to show you some of her favorite poses. So um, you just touched on what I was going to do there now, Aparna, accessibility and inclusivity are these things that are really, really close to my heart. Um, I'm very lucky in that I have a healthy body. There's nothing wrong really with my body. A few aches and pains, you know, I'm 41. So these things start to happen as we get older. But there's many, many people in our community who don't have healthy bodies or maybe they don't have a healthy mind um, or, or to full health, you know. Um, they might have injuries or illness. Perhaps people are struggling with different things going on in, in their body. And I found that a lot of people told me that they couldn't come to my yoga class because they felt like they didn't belong. They felt like it wasn't their place to come because they couldn't sit like the way I'm sitting on the mat. Um, I'm used to this, so it's fine for me. But for a lot of people, it's not. And we see all these yoga props as well at the studios. A lot of us don't even know how to use them. I know yoga teachers who do not know how to use props. And I find that really upsetting. Um, so one thing that I've been uh, really looking into and learning about and educating myself on is using props and making the practice accessible to people. So I want to show you some things that we can do with our props in our yoga practice. And it's a few little poses. You can join in at home if you have these as well. And I always start sitting on a cushion. But that's actually quite low. A cushion is quite low, but you could sit on some blocks at the start of class or you could always start sitting on your chair. I teach um, a lot of chair yoga as well. And you might have heard about chair yoga, but you might not really know that much about it or think it's just for people who um, have physical disabilities. Um, but it's not. Anybody can do chair yoga. So here's my chair. <laughs> I'm going to show you one of the ways that I use the chair. So if you if you have students or if you are a student who's got balance issues, you can use the chair to hold on to for any of the standing postures. So even for Tadasana, some people feel that it's wobbly for them and they need support. So they could have one hand on the chair. And this could be the difference between a student being able to close their eyes and not close their eyes in Tadasana. Because if you think about it, sometimes when you close your eyes, you can feel disorientated and then you open them, you might feel a little dizzy. So if they've got the chair there, then that's a lovely little bit of support for them. The same way with Virabhadrasana 1, you could have the chair here and you could begin holding onto the chair. And then from there, maybe you could raise the arms up. So some people in your class might have both hands on the chair and then some people might have one hand reaching up. Others might take two hands up. So this is how it can be really supportive and can really help us to access these poses in our practice. And then likewise as well for Virabhadrasana 2, it can be right there and you can come into the pose, holding on to it maybe the whole time while you're in the pose or perhaps you let go at some stage. And that's one of the ways I really like to use it. Another way would be for Virabhadrasana 2 as well. You could have the chair. Now, this is much more advanced. So this could be uh, more of an Iyengar style. But um, for a lot of people who just find they don't have an alignment or they don't feel comfortable, if they climb through their chair, move the back leg back. So we've got the um, toes turned in a little on the back leg and the back leg is straight. The front leg is bent. And I'm working here just to keep the knee over the heel. So I don't want to come into this lunge, even though I have that support underneath, that's okay. Then we just want that alignment to be really nice. And you might stay here. You can see there's a gap here between um, me and the chair, or maybe your student will sit down or you might sit down and see how that feels. And then perhaps the arms might reach out. So here we've got a really nice supported Virabhadrasana too. And then you can add poses on such as, revolved 
and then maybe Parvita Parsvakanasana, extended side angle pose, and then come back out. And this is a tricky one to climb back out of. But thinking about props and making things accessible to the yoga practice, even for meditation, the most simple ever, sitting in the chair. There we go. <laughs> so I hope that you guys will try using the chair during your practice. You can use it um, in such a variety of different ways to access lots of poses. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you can contact me as well and ask me. I've got um, six YouTube videos on um, YouTube, all sitting in the chair. So you can have a look at them if you like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. That was excellent. And actually, yes, using props does not come easy even for many yoga teachers. That is so true. And the way that you have demonstrated now, I understand that why your students love you so much because mm -hmm. you make things accessible for everyone and no one would ever feel that as if they can do something in your class. So Christine has a website, Yogra Yoga, and everywhere on the social media platform and all the social media links are on that website and the YouTube, as she has already mentioned. So if you are interested in doing chair yoga, then do contact Christine or any of her yoga workshops. She's an amazing teacher. I was her student. And I, she was one of my teacher in my yoga teacher training. So thank you so much, Christine. I can't thank you enough for this very, very special session. And we will meet again soon. Thank you so we much. We definitely Namaste. will. Thank you so much, Aparna. Namaste. Namaste.